Are there any artists in, in the room, any like painters or sculptors, anybody brave enough to say they're into that good, a few of you guys? Um, I, 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 one of the things that always makes me feel really out of my depth and really uncomfortable is going to any kind of art museum or art display or something like that where, you know, you walk in and people just ponder uh, the paintings and the art. And, and the, the reason it makes me uncomfortable is because uh, I have no idea if it's good or not, Right? You know, like, I know what I like, I know what makes me happy, and what I think looks good, but the art community sometimes has a totally different standard for what's good and what's not, right? And so I could look at something that looks incredible, and they could go, that's terrible, I can't believe you like that, and then you're like, oh, I'm sorry I said anything, right? And you want to run away and hide. And that's because there, there, are certain, uh, there are certain rules, there are certain guidelines, there are certain technical skills and abilities and, and perspectives and schools of thought that make art, uh, by whatever committee decides these things, good or not, right? And, and I was thinking about that as I was thinking about our text this morning, our passage this morning, because church, in many ways, can be similar, right? There, there can be a sense in which uh, you could ask, someone could ask the question, how do we know if this is a good church or not, if this is a faithful church or not, if this is a biblical church or not? How do we know if this is the place that I should plant my family and the place that I should come week in and week out, right? If you were to pick up and move tomorrow to a new city and you had to go find a new church, how would you decide? How would you go, yeah, this is the one for me? What would be on your checklist? What would be the parameters that you would use to determine if this is the right church uh, for you, if this was a good and faithful uh, church? And in our, our passage this morning, the Apostle Paul gives us a little glimpse. This is not the total picture, so don't hear me saying that everything we're going to talk about this morning is everything that goes into being a good church, but this is some of it. And in our passage this morning, the Apostle Paul is going to talk us through his ministry approach, his approach to the calling that God had placed on his life and how he viewed his ministry assignment. And he's going to outline some priorities he had, some markers of it, and that's going to give us a window as a church for what a good church looks like. And by beginning to understand what that looks like, we can begin to evaluate ourselves against God's Word and see and make sure that we are operating in accordance with God's Word. So that's where we're going this morning. That's the direction of our text. Uh, I'm going to read uh, Colossians 1, 24 through 29, then I'm going to pray, and then we're going to dive into it. Look with me at Colossians chapter 1. The Apostle Paul writes this, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, he says, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister, According to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. Verse 27, it says, To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for your spirit inspiring it to be written, your spirit making it relevant to all ages and all generations across all eras. God, you have something to say to us from your word. And I pray as we work through this passage this morning that you would accomplish your purposes through it, that you would speak to us, you would reveal to us who you are, you would reveal to us how we can best follow you, God, and you would help us to fall more in love with you than we were when we came here. So speak, Lord, your servants are listening, in Jesus' name, amen. So really quickly, I want to walk through kind of this text. Paul says some interesting stuff here, some, some weird stuff, so I'll give you a, a gist of what's going on here, and then we'll highlight a few things that... Uh, this passage has to say. Uh, and when we're studying a book like Colossians, Colossians is not a long book. It's, it's only four chapters long, but we're going to be in it for a long time because we're zooming in on, on this text and we're working through it really slowly, piece by piece and verse by verse. And when you do that, that's good because you can pull a lot out of it. But there's also a temptation to miss the big picture, isn't there? Because you zoom in so close that you forget to see the entirety of it. And letters, as you guys know, uh, you guys remember, you guys have ever seen a letter? A letter is like a thing that you people would write on paper, and they would fold up the paper, stick it in an envelope. They have these things called stamps that go on the outside, and they mail them to people. Uh, well, in the old days, of Paul's day, they had letters too, although I'm not sure they had stamps. He would just hand it to a friend who was going to Colossae and say, hey, would you deliver this letter? 
Letters weren't meant to be, they didn't read, in, in the church of Colossae, they didn't read uh, five verses of the letter, five sentences, and then fold it up and say, next week we'll read some more, right? No, they stood up and read the letter as a whole, as a unit. And so we've got to keep the whole unit of Colossians in mind as we read. And so if you kind of recap where we've been thus far in chapter 1, as we've, uh, Paul's opened the letter by expressing his thankfulness, his joy for this church that's been birthed here in this city. And we've got to keep in mind that we learn he's combating a false teaching that's going on. He's writing to correct bad doctrine in this church. And then last week, um, we, we kind of ended our, our time on verse 23, where Paul encouraged the church not to shift from the hope of the gospel that you heard, he says, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven. And then he ends with this sentence, of which, or this phrase, of which I, Paul, became a minister. And so he said, hey, don't shift from this message of the gospel. I'm a minister of this gospel. This is the thing. And in our passage today, what he does is he explains what he means by that. When he says, I'm a minister of this message, he's going to walk us through what it means for him to be a minister of this message. And so uh, in summary, basically this, this passage, what, what I just read to you, verses 24 to 29, says this. Paul sees his goal is the same as he, what he said in verse 23, is to present the church holy and blameless, he says, to Jesus. And he sees his, his role, his calling to help accomplish that. And he sees that calling as being straight from the Lord, that the Lord himself has called him to this ministry and mission. He goes on to say that this task, this ministry, and this calling, it requires suffering, but he rejoices in those sufferings because the task also includes proclaiming the mystery and the beauty of Jesus. Included in that beauty is our source of hope, Jesus dwelling inside of us. And so, because Jesus is everything, as we read in verses 15 through 19, that's who Paul says, I'm going to proclaim. Him we proclaim, he says. He says this proclaiming of Jesus has two aspects, as we'll see, teaching and warning. And the result of this teaching and warning is the people of God being mature in their faith, which was the goal of verse 23 to begin with. And so Paul concludes by saying this is a hard calling, but he's going to lean on the power of Jesus to do it. So that's the, that's the gist. That's the summary, kind of layman's terms, my interpretation of kind of how this passage works. And I want to zoom in this morning on three aspects of it. We'll spend most of our time in two, and we'll kind of close in number three, but two, uh, two or three aspects of this calling that Paul has. And first, just the, the calling itself. I want to look at how God called Paul, what he called him to, uh, and then we're going to look at Paul's message, the message that God called him to proclaim, and then we're going to look finally at the strength that Paul has uh, and where it comes from for how he's going to proclaim that message. So Paul's calling, again, verse 24 through 26 Paul says he rejoices in sufferings for their sake. And in my flesh, he says, I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister, he says. And so he begins by saying a really odd phrase that we could perhaps confuse. He says, I, I'm filling up what was lacking in Christ's sufferings. And immediately that makes most readers go, whoa, whoa, what was Jesus lacking? Jesus didn't lack anything. I thought you just said Jesus was preeminent over and above everything a few verses previous. What was Jesus lacking. And what Paul's not saying is that Jesus came up short or Jesus didn't do enough. What he's saying is that what, what Paul's calling is, is to spread the message of the gospel, and that's going to require suffering. That wasn't Jesus's calling. Jesus's calling was to die on a cross for the sins of the world, right? And so Jesus suffered to accomplish that mission. Paul's saying, hey, I've got to now suffer to accomplish the mission that God's called me to, spreading that message and teaching people who Jesus is and what he's done. And so Paul says, hey, that's my calling. And Paul's calling specifically was to be what the Bible calls an apostle, an apostle. An apostle is a unique calling connected to the early church that basically amounts to being a serial church planner. Like Paul would go town to town to town, share the gospel with a group of people. When enough people would put their faith in Jesus, they'd form a church. Paul would install some pastors and elders and say, you guys are in charge. I'm out of here going to the next city. And he would go and he would do it all over again. All, a lot of the letters that we get from Paul are him writing back to these churches. He started and say, hey, I heard of what's going on. Most of it's good. A lot of it's bad. Here's what you need to fix, right? And that's where we get a lot of our New Testament, really, is Paul writing back to these churches that he started or places he wants to go to start a church. And so Paul was a, an apostle in addition to this kind of church planting role that he had. He also had a measure of authority in the early church for setting doctrine and direction for the church along with the other apostles. 
And what he tells us here, though, is that his, it's, it's extremely applicable for our church. Even though Paul's calling is different than the calling of maybe a pastor or a church ministry leader, it is very related and very close, and we can learn a lot about how ministry ought to be done here at our church from what Paul says about his ministry in that time. And so he tells us a few things about his calling. He says it comes from the Lord. He says it centers on proclaiming the word. He says it, uh, it's, uh, it's going to involve suffering. He says it's for the sake of the church. And so I want to look at a few of those things first. And, and so this, is, this first idea, and the central idea to Paul's calling, is that it comes from God. He says this calling was according to the stewardship from God that was given to me. God clearly and powerfully called the Apostle Paul to ministry on the road to Emmaus. If you remember in the book of Acts, he stops him on the road and blinds him and speaks to him and changes his life dramatically. And then he has a period of, uh, of training and preparation. And then that calling is confirmed in Paul's life by other leaders and other apostles. And then he begins his ministry. And I want to say just as an aside for us, what does all this mean for us? I, I, I believe firmly with all my heart that God is still to this day calling people to ministry. And he's still to this day doing it in a very similar way that he did it for the Apostle Paul. He may not stop us on the road and blind us with the light, although some afternoons this summer it has felt like that's what was happening. But God does call people, the people of God, out of their normal routines, out of the direction they were going, out of the life they were living, and say, hey, I've got a new plan for you. I want you to serve my church. I want you to be a proclaimer of the gospel. I was meeting last week with a member of our church who's kind of working through uh, that, that kind of calling. We were talking about how calling works, and I shared with him a, a, a formula, if you will, that served me well over the years for how you dis discern if God is calling you to something. Usually it begins with an internal desire. I want to do this. This is in me. I desire this. I desire this ministry, this, this task or this assignment. And then there's external confirmation, right? There's, there's people around you, people in your life, leaders, people that know you, who have observed your life, who go, you know what, I see that in you. You're right. You, you may actually be called to this. And then finally, there's an opportunity to step into. God opens a door, if you will, for you to step into and, and embrace that ministry that you've decided he's called you to and other people have affirmed he's called you to. Then you step in and you do it. That's just a helpful formula that we can use to know if God is calling us to something. It doesn't have to be calling you to be a pastor or something, a grand, like a, or a ministry leader or, or a missionary or something like that. But maybe God's calling you to step into uh, service in this church or some kind of assignment in your job or in your life. There are all sorts of ways that you can apply this to help discern if God's calling you to something. But I want to say just, this is an aside, it's kind of not a main point of kind of our conversation this morning, but if you sense that maybe God might be calling you to ministry in any way, would you come see me? Come talk to me about it. I would love to help you navigate this and walk through this together. I believe God is and will continue to call people out for the ministry. Paul also says that his calling is centered on proclaiming the word. He said his calling is centered on proclaiming the word. In verse 25 and 26, he said his task was to make the word of God fully known. The mystery, hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. And when he says that, to make the word of God fully known, there's some debate. Like uh, Greek scholars, they're, they're trying to figure out what does Paul mean by that. Does he mean make the word fully known to the people who are already Christians? Should they get to know deeply the, the God's word and fully understand the scriptures? Or is he talking about reaching lots of people? Like getting really wide, make the word, the word fully known across tons and tons of people. And there's, there's, there's evidence for maybe both in Scripture, speaking to the church in Ephesus, in the book of Acts, Paul points out that he taught them the whole counsel of God, right? So there's evidence that we might be talking about teaching people deeply, te teaching people all that the Bible has to say about following the Lord. But also in the book of Acts, in chapter 13, speaking in Antioch, Paul says that God had commanded him to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. So now we're getting back to, is Paul talking about preaching wide and reaching as many people as possible? Ministers and churches and ministries will sometimes tend towards one or the other, won't they? If you've been around church for a little bit, you may have noticed this, that, that some uh, churches or organizations or pastors are focused on min reaching as many as possible. Let's go as wide as we can. The depth doesn't matter all that much. The goal is just to get as many as we can and reach them with the message of the gospel, right? And there are other churches, maybe you've been to these, where the goal isn't wide so much as it is deep, like, how deep can we go? How much Bible can we teach people? How into the scriptures can we get? How holistic can our discipleship be? You may be wondering which camp your new pastor falls into. 
Maybe I'm naive. Maybe I'm overly optimistic. Maybe I'm just plain crazy. But church, I want to do both. I want to reach as many people with the gospel as humanly possible. Amen. We're going to have to do it together. I want to reach as many people with the gospel as humanly possible. I want to see thousands upon thousands of people trust Jesus as Savior and Lord. And then I want to teach them to walk with him deeply. And I believe the church is called to do both. I believe the Bible tells us to do both. That's the reason there's evidence for both throughout the scriptures. This is our task as a church, is to reach anybody and everybody we can with the gospel. And then teach them everything we possibly can in the life God gives them about their Savior and Lord. I'm convinced this is also the best strategy for reaching people. Because mature believers who know God deeply and love him with their whole heart and life, they're the best disciple makers. They're the best God evangelists. They're the best people at sharing Christ with other people because they know the depths of God's love for them. And so that was Paul's approach. He was proclaiming the word to anybody he could and as holistically as he could. And Paul goes on to say that this calling that God had placed on his life to proclaim the word, it was for the sake of the church. He says, uh, for you, or for your sake, or for their sake. He says it three times in just these two or three verses we're looking at this morning. Three times he says that in these first few verses. His calling was decidedly for the benefit of others. It wasn't for his benefit. And when God calls people to gospel ministry, he doesn't do it for their own fame, for their own notoriety, for their own platform. He does it for the sake of the church. Myself, every one of our pastors, every member of our church staff, We are here not for us. We are here for you. We exist to serve this church. Our entire purpose is the same as Paul listed, that we might present the members of Fort Caroline Baptist Church holy and blameless to the Lord Jesus at the end of the age. Put in layman's terms, our church staff, our church leaders exist to help you walk with Jesus and to help you reach other people with the gospel. Practically, this means we want to be involved in your lives. We want to be involved in your lives. All of us have areas of the church we're responsible for, right? So Craig has musical gifts, so we let him play the guitar. You don't want me playing the guitar. We let Craig do it because he's good at it, right? But Craig is also called to pastor you, right? Same with Joe. Joe, We give Joe uh, groups and, and students because that's something he's got skills and gifts and abilities and passions for. But Joe is the pastor of all of us as well. And this is true for every, I don't want to list all of our staff and pastors, but this is true for everybody in our church. We're here to serve you, We're here to shepherd you. This means no matter what we've got going on, no matter what our schedule entails, we're never too busy for you. This is true for me. My door, whether it's actually open or not, is always open to you. I'm available to you to serve you. The other stuff can wait. We want to be with you. This calling is for you. This means we want to know how we can pray for you. If you've got prayer needs in your life, I can't pray for them if I don't know about them. Our staff, every week at staff meeting, we will pray for the prayer requests that come in to our church. You can call the church office. You can use that card right in front of you, turn it in, and we will pray for those requests throughout the week. But we can't pray if we don't know. This means we want to know when we can be celebrating with you, too. You've got good stuff happening in your life. Please tell us about it. We want to know when you're sick. We want to know when you're in your hospital. We want to know when a loved one passes away. We want to know when you're, uh, when you're struggling in your faith. We want to know when you have questions about your faith. We want to, we want to know when you take, want to take a step forward in your leadership. Whatever it is, we want to do it with you. Why? Because this calling, just like it was for Paul, for us, is for you. So that's our calling and our commitment to you. Finally, Paul says about his calling that it's marked by suffering. He says it's marked by suffering. In verse 24, he says he rejoices in these sufferings for the church's sake. And he goes on to say that he's filling up what he's lacking, as we've addressed. And Paul, if you know anything about again about his ministry, you know it was definitely marked by suffering, wasn't it? In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul recounts all of the hardship he went through. Beginning in verse 24, he says, this, he says, Five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. Verse 27, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there's the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. So Paul described his his ministry to the church at Corinth. 
And he tells the Colossians here, he says, hey, this is hard. I'm not going to lie to you, it's hard. There's suffering involved. I've never been shipwrecked personally, but Lord, if you call me to it, I'll do it. But I recognize some of these things. I've also never been beaten for the gospel, praise the Lord. We're lucky here in our country that's uh, not on the docket for us. But there is a suffering and a cost and a weight and a heaviness that comes with gospel ministry, and Paul articulates that here. Ministry by nature of being people work is hard. It is heavy oftentimes. It's not hard like maybe being a contractor is. I was meeting with John Powell the other day. He's a contractor in our church in our area, and he does hard work like with his hands lifting stuff, building stuff, stuff that takes skills that I don't have. It's, that's hard. Ministry work is a different type of hard, right? I'm not often doing construction, but I do, and all of us in ministry do carry kind of emotional and spiritual burdens as we walk with people through the difficulties of life. This week I had some friends uh, drive over from Tallahassee to spend the day with me, and they're, they're both pastors at a church there, and we were talking shop, and um, they let me know that when they arrived, they spent the entire two and a half hour drive from Tallahassee to here planning the funeral for a three-year-old in their church that had died. Just gut-wrenching stuff. And a Fourth of July party fell in the pool, drowned before anybody noticed. And they're, they're, they're just carrying this. And this is just another, I mean, I don't want to minimize or trivialize this, but in many ways, this is another day at the office for someone in the ministry. And I say that not to seek your pity, not to seek your um, compassion, but just so that you can understand, like Paul does, that we are here to walk with you through the good and the really, really bad. And like Paul, I say to you, and all of our pastors would agree with us, we do this with joy. Why? Because we get to proclaim Christ in you, the hope of glory. There's joy in the sorrow. There's heartache in the pain. My, my friend told me it was an honor to be a part of sitting with the family that day when the, the child died. And it'll be an honor to sit with you as we walk through the ups and downs of life together. So Paul says, hey, my message is hard. Or my calling is hard, but my message is great news. My calling is from God, and so I'm going to give it everything that I have because I love you. Let's keep going. Paul's message, the message that he came to proclaim. Look at me, look with me at verse 27 and 28. He says, To them, talking about the Gentiles, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For Paul, Jesus was the message. He says, him we proclaim. That's it. That's the point. Jesus is the centerpiece. And I've said this to you already in a few sermons, and I'm going to keep telling you this, that Jesus and the message of the gospel is the centerpiece of what the Bible is about. Every book of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, is about Jesus and what he's done for us on the cross. It's about Jesus and the hope that we can have in him. And it all points to Jesus, flows from Jesus. It's about Jesus. Him we proclaim. And Paul says, that's the source of my message. That's the centerpiece of my ministry. He told the Corinthians the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He said, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why? Because that's the only thing that has any power to save. It's Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the only thing that has any power to change lives. That's the only thing that has any power to redeem. That's the only thing that has any power to wipe away shame and guilt and hurt and heartache. It's the only thing that has any power to overcome sin and the grave. Jesus on a cross. And so he says, him we proclaim. And Paul says his message, it included both a warning and a teaching. Uh, the, the message of the gospel has both a positive and negative implications to it. Positive, if we put our faith in Jesus, he becomes our hope of glory. He seals and secures our eternity in heaven by paying the price for our sins. That's the good news of the gospel. Negatively, though, Rejecting Christ means an eternity separated from the Lord in punishment for turning away, paying the price for our sins ourselves. And so there's a warning involved with the gospel message, Paul says. But it's important that we notice the emphasis in this text and throughout the scriptures that the Apostle Paul places on teaching the word of God. Paul believed that understanding God's word was essential to walking with God. And it's hard to overstate how important teaching the Bible is to the message of the New Testament. Jesus' title for his disciples, they, what did they call him? They didn't call him Savior and Lord until the very end. What did they call him? They said, teacher. Jesus was their teacher. 
Nearly every book in the New Testament mentions this idea of teaching. The New Testament has 110 uses of the word teaching, which is more than the Old Testament has, despite being a third of the size of the Old Testament. Teaching the Bible is a central theme. Teaching the Word of God is a central theme of the Scriptures. The Great Commission, right? The marching orders for the church. It tells us to do two things. It says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is shorthand for just reach people to the gospel and get them saved, baptize them. And then what does it say to do after that? Teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. And Jesus reminds us he's with us all the way through that. If we only focus on evangelism and reaching the lost, but pay no attention to teaching them after that, we've called them to a task that they don't have the tools to complete. Every guy's favorite store is Lowe's or Home Depot. Every guy has a preference, too, between those two. And every guy sees uh, the home improvement projects that they are asked to do or they decide to do as an opportunity to go get new tools, don't we, right? Whenever, whenever your wife says, hey, wouldn't it be cool if, if, you know, if we, we did this kind of shiplap thing over the, the fireplace? A guy hears, I get to go shopping, right? Because we, inevitably, we need a new tool for the task at hand. And a lot of times, those tools aren't really necessary. We just pretend and maybe fudge the truth a little bit to convince our wives that they're necessary for the task, don't we? This confession time is a safe place. The Bible says, confess your sins, he'll forgive you. <laughs> but we'll have to go get a new tool. But really, truly, if you, if you think about kind of the necessity for tools for accomplishing a task, a lot of times you do have to have certain tools to finish a project. It's tough to put on a, ro a roof without a nailer or without a hammer, right? It's pretty difficult. In a lot of ways, if we only focus on reaching people with the gospel, only focus on evangelism, what we, but we don't give people the tools to walk with God after that, we've called them to a task, to a project that they don't have the tools to finish. And so our mission as a church has to be to do both. It was Paul's mission. It should be our mission as well. But even still, I'm going to get off this hobby horse in a little bit, but I'm going to write it just a little bit longer. Even still, I sometimes hear that we shouldn't emphasize teaching or study. We shouldn't think about theology so much. And the argument goes that the average church member doesn't care about this stuff. The argument goes that the average church member can't handle hard conversations and hard topics. And the, the argument goes the average church member will just be so overwhelmed if we really study God's word in depth. And i got to tell you, church, I don't think that's true. I don't think it's true at all. I think God's people are hungry for his word. I think the people of the world around us are desperate to see if this Christian faith that we say we are so passionate about really does answer life's hard questions. And I think we do ourselves, our churches, and the lost people around us a huge disservice if we don't press in to these things. In the book of Hebrews, the author addresses people who have neglected pressing in deeply to the Word of God. Chapter 5, beginning verse 12, says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food, it says, is for the mature. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. The author of Hebrews makes this analogy of a child who never moves past milk and onto solid food. It makes us think, what would we say if we came across a 12-year-old who had never learned to eat solid food but was just drinking milk still? I think the first thing we might say is that's so sad. He's missing out on just the riches of the goodness of all that the culinary world has to offer. The second thing we'd probably say is shame on his parents for not teaching him to eat solid food. And I'm convinced there are Christians all over the place who would love nothing more than to feast on the deep truths of God, but they have no one to feed them. And as long as I fill this pulpit, my prayer is that by the grace of God, we together would mine the depths of God's word and we would together taste and see that the Lord is good. And I'm convinced that that won't keep people away, but it'll make people come in and say, man, I got to see who this God is that people are just feasting on and filled with joy in and have life in and an excitement for. I need to know this God. Paul says the end goal is maturity in verse 28, and it comes by feasting on God's word. 
Finally, as we close, Paul's strength for accomplishing this calling, this task that God had given him in verse 29, he said, For this I toil, struggling with all the energy that, powerful, that God powerfully works within me. Paul calls his ministry a toil and a struggle. We've talked a little bit about that earlier, so we won't belabor the point. But it's not a ministry that Paul has to do in his own strength. And whatever ministry God calls you to and God calls me to, and let me be clear, he's calling all of us to a ministry. Whatever ministry he calls us to, he wants to work through us. The Spirit of God working through Paul empowered his ministry, and that's true for you and for me and for what God calls us to. When you don't know what to say, the Bible says the Holy Spirit will speak through you. When you don't have the confidence you need to step into what God's called you to do, the Lord grants courage. We don't have the skills required for the task at hand. The Lord, the Bible says, will enable you to do it anyways. And I wonder, even this morning, in this room right now, if there isn't someone who knows the Lord's calling them to something. It may be something like pastoral ministry or being a missionary or a church planner, or church staff member, something like that. It could be something like serving in kids' ministry or leading a life group or sharing the gospel with a neighbor. But I wonder if there isn't someone here today that the Lord's calling something to, and they go, I don't have what it takes. And I think the Bible would say you absolutely do not. But the Lord does. And he will do it through you if you will give him the opportunity. The Bible says he who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. The Lord will accomplish his purposes through you. And so as we close, maybe three questions for you to take home with you and ponder as you go from this place, I mean, the drive home or this week as you're spending time with the Lord. First question is this, is how can you take a step forward in your understanding of God and his word? How can you take a step forward in your understanding of God and his word? Maybe it's time for you to join a life group. Maybe it's making Sunday worship a non-negotiable. You're kind of in and out of Sunday worship. This isn't a high priority for your family. You make this your non-negotiable week in and week out. Maybe it's committing to reading scripture daily. I don't know. But I know the Lord is calling all of us to step forward in our understanding of him. So where is it that he wants you to do that? Second question, how might God be calling you to minister on his behalf? What ministry assignment might God have for you? I have a little secret for you. This upsets people sometimes when I tell them this. The Bible is very clear that pastors are not called to do ministry. Did you know that? Pastors are not called to do ministry. Pastors are called to train you to do ministry. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning of verse 11, we could read all of Ephesians 4, it would be glorious, but we don't have time. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 says, He, talking about Jesus, the Lord, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Paul says to the church at Ephesus, hey, listen, these leaders that you've been given, their job isn't to go reach the world for Christ. Their job is to equip you to reach the world for Christ. And that's our task as your leaders as well, is to equip you, to teach you God's word, to teach you how to lead, to teach you how to share, to encourage you, to walk beside you as you do it, as you reach those in your life for Jesus, as you make disciples of the kids in our church, as you make disciples of the students and college students and other adults in our church, your job is to do the ministry. And so, how is God calling you to do that? Where would he call you to step in? I want you to ask him that this week and see what he might say to you. And lastly, just a question to ponder, and some of you guys are going to tune me out and say, this is not me, and you're the ones especially I want to do this. I want you to ask the Lord, is he calling me to vocational ministry? Meaning this, is God calling me to step away from however I earn my living now and instead spend my whole life, my entire professional life, serving the Lord? It's not going to be most of you. That's not how it works. God, God, God selects a few to lead so that we can all do this, right? But I think it's some of you. And I would be willing to bet, I'm not a betting man, but if I was, I'd be willing to bet that in this church there are two or three or four or five or maybe even ten of you that God has placed a burden on your heart for international missions. That you could see yourself moving overseas to Haiti or Honduras or somewhere else and giving your life to a group of people who need the gospel. If that's you, I want you to ask God earnestly, are you calling me to this? Or maybe you have a gift or a desire to teach God's word to people and you've loved doing it in students or kids and you wish you could do more of it. I want you to ask God this week, is he calling me to do this with my 
whole life. See what he might say. He might say no, and that's fine. You can keep serving faithfully where you are. But he might say yes. And we have a lot of fun after that. All right, I'm over time. I got, they have red, red uh, numbers on the back. They tell me when I've talked too much. I've talked too much. Friends, this church belongs to you. It's up to you to make sure that we're doing what God has called us to do, that we're accomplishing the purposes that God has given us as a congregation. And that purpose, part of it, is proclaiming the message of the gospel far and wide and calling those people to trust Christ and then teaching them to walk with Jesus day by day by day. And so as we leave this place, church family, let's go resolved to do just that, to walk with Jesus daily so that his hope and joy might shine through us to a world that needs Jesus more than anything else on earth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power that your word has to change us. What an incredible formula you've devised that your word plus your spirit changes us, makes us different people, changes our desires, our goals, our motivations, our dreams, our wants, everything. And I pray that your word would have that effect on me and on each one of us as we walk with you this week. Lord, we love you, Lord. We thank you for our church family. We thank you that you've given us a place to gather and to be encouraged by singing your word, praying your word, studying your word. And as we go from this place, I pray that we proclaim your word to those who need to hear it. In Jesus' name, amen.